and sisters, Dr. Puna has been giving Dharma talks regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, and Bangkok, and has been invited to speak at several global conferences on Buddhism. Well, Dr. Puna has been talking, giving talks, online talks via Facebook and YouTube, following his own book, Breaking Myths. That was the first online talk. And now we are following up with the talk, Walking in Buddha's Footprint. Well, Dr. Buna has been making those Dharma talks interesting with his audience in mind for easy understanding and the messages would direct. Tonight's title is Facing Relatives. Well, why we can expect something that we have to learn and all of us, all Buddhists have to learn. Expectations often do not meet reality. I will leave it to all of you to listen to the talk and see what we can pick up and take home. We will definitely have a great learning from this particular talk. Brothers and sisters in the Dharma, let us welcome Dr. Puna. Over to you, Dr. Puna. Thank you, Brother Chuan. Thank you so much for introduction. And tonight, dear Dhamma family, we are very, very pleased, very, very happy to let you know that we are actually broadcasting from Sukhya in this venerable old temple in Malacca. And first, I must say that last year, when the MCO was at its height, we started with Subang Jaya Buddhist Association hosting the very first talk from the Breaking Myths series. And now, literally two books later, we are coming to the second last talk of this series, and again, rightly hosted by Subang Jaya Buddhist Association. And a fortnight from now will be the penultimate final talk of this series, also to be hosted by Subang Jaya Buddhist Association. So tonight, as you can see, we are broadcasting from this wonderful temple, this grand old madam of Buddhist temples in Malaysia, Sakya Inn in Malacca. And I want to say thank you very, very much to the lovely people in Malacca who hosted us and who worked so hard to ensure that everything is running smoothly for the broadcast tonight. In two weeks time, I personally hope that I will be able to broadcast the final talk from Subang Jaya and we will try our best to see if we can fulfill that. Give me a few minutes as I share the screen now. All right, dear Dhamma family, facing realities. One of the big difference in the Buddhist teachings when compared to other philosophies or religions, the Buddhist teachings train us realities. The Buddha does not want any one of us to harbor fantasies of rebirth in a heavenly realm and living eternally in bliss, nor does he want to mislead us onto petitional states where one petitions via prayers and offerings for all kinds of so-called blessings or wishes. The Buddha, in fact, wants us to be realistic as to the happiness and dukkha and stresses of life. He wants us to be realistic and to use our intellect. If we are brothers and sisters to look at the teachings of the Buddha, 
And while there are almost 20,000 suttas, which can be confusing for a lot of people, the core of the Buddha's teachings, in fact, is in these very few numbers, 84000. In Chinese, you often hear this as and many people wrongly attribute this to a later teaching or a Mahayana teaching. No, this is actually from the Theragatha, and this is actually said by the Venerable Ananda. When he said that 82,000 teachings are from the Buddha's mouth, and 2,000 teachings are from the senior disciples. But if you look at these 84,000 teachings or Pa Wan Si Tian Fang, you will see that they all have a central core. Eight, for example, is the Eightfold Path, for which every one of us who wishes to follow the Buddha's teaching will try to live our lives following the Eightfold Path. And in the process, we try to direct experience, to direct insight, to understand the Four Noble Truths. And in the process, also understand the three universal characteristics represented by zero, zero, zero of impermanence, a nature, and saturation. Anatta. Zero being often representative of sunyata or emptiness. So while the Buddha Dharma had diversified in many ways because of culture, because of geographical influences, the core teachings of the Buddha deals with the realities of life. And here in the Eightfold Path, the Four Noble Truths, and the Three Universal Characteristics. Herein are the core teachings of the Buddha Dhamma. And these very much teaches us to deal not with fantasies or hopes of a future that is blissful and everlasting, but of now and in this very moment, living and handling and living harmoniously and happily moment to moment in the present life. Now, every one of us experience dukkha or dissatisfaction. And part of the dissatisfaction comes from the fact, from the reality that things are impermanent. Never is there anything which is permanent. The only thing permanent is change or impermanence. So, our bodies are impermanent, our politics are impermanent, our organizations are impermanent, literally everything, including our family, our loved ones, they are all impermanent. But it is not the impermanence which is a common characteristic, a universal characteristic that gives us emotional suffering. What gives us emotional suffering or dukkha is that we want it to be permanent. We want it to be the opposite of what is reality. And that is why we suffer. We suffer because we do not live in tune or in harmony with reality. We suffer because we want reality to be what we demand it to be. What the Buddha taught is for us to have direct vision right wheels into what is reality, not what we imagine it to be, and to live harmoniously so that we can have the least dissatisfaction or dukkha because we understand life as it is. Now in Chinese, it is very interesting that the word Dhamma or Fa is written with three dots of water on the left, and on the right, to go out, to proceed. So, if we understand the Dhamma, if we understand what the Buddha teaches us, then we realize that we must flow like water 
around rocks, around obstacles, and these will give us the least resistance to life. Dear Dhamma family, you will find often in our lives, always, no matter what station we are, problems. My students in med school often will ask the patient, oh, uncle, can you tell me, do you have any stress? Or are you subject to stress? And I will often tease them and say, show me a person with no stress and I will show you a dead man, a corpse. Because as long as you are alive, unless you are an enlightened being, you are going to have stress, emotional distress, what is called dukkha. Because problems, as stated in the very first noble truth, is the common denominator of life. Now, please do not mistaken that the Buddha says that everything is suffering. No, 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 no. That is a misconception. In fact, the Buddha said that there is lots of happiness and lots of sukha, but there is dukkha. And no one can escape that dukkha. And in the first noble truth, the Buddha clearly classified this dukkha as birth, aging, sickness, death, association with those that you do not like, dissociation from those that we love and we like, not getting what we want, and the five grasping gandhas or aggregates. So while there is lots of happiness in life, there are also lots of problems, many of which we cannot overcome, like aging and death. Now, many things we can solve, but many things, for example, like aging, is not a problem that we can solve but a reality that we must learn to accept and deal with. And this is what the Buddha Dharma tells us about. Not fantasies, but realities. A sister only this morning texts me asking me about right views. And I sent her this. The Buddha pointed out many times to us that we must contemplate discuss, reflect, share, as in this sharing forum, on what are the realities of life, because we need to have the right views, samaditi. Now, this is because the Buddha said that if we have wrong views, then these wrong views will lead to wrong decisions, wrong speech, wrong action, and finally, a lot of dukkha, and ultimately even wrong release. So let me give you an example. What do we mean by a wrong view? For example, a wrong view that only my way of achieving this is correct. So in everything that we do, in all our actions, our speech, we will be based on this very strong attachment that only my way is correct and no other way is correct. And that can lead to lots of wrong actions. For example, historically, let us take a look at the pre-Middle Ages and you see, for example, very strong religious body saying, oh, only this way is correct. All other ways is wrong and people were burnt or drowned as witches and all kinds of suffering because someone held to a very strong attachment that only my way is right and all other ways are wrong. Upadana, who views the Buddha said, Bhitti Upadana is something very, very powerful, very strong and can lead to lots of wrong decisions and wrong actions leading to pain and suffering. Examples are endless to my view that my race is superior, my view that only this particular people are able to do this particular thing, my view that all other customs are wrong, only my tradition, my lineage is correct. And that attachment 
the Buddha said, can be so strong that it is a condition that will lead us to be reborn again and again, an upadana or attachment. So now what we do as lay Buddhists is that these teachings that the Buddha gave us, the Eightfold Path, the Four Noble Truth, the Universal Characteristics, we take them as the GPS of our lives, the guidelines which helps us as we deal with day-to-day -day living. And as we live, as we reflect, we look at these guidelines and we look at life around us and we see, are they correct? We reinforce that it is correct. We see and test it in our daily lives. So if the Buddha said, all things are impermanent, we look around us and see, are all things truly impermanent? Are the common denominators of suffering truly there for everyone? And when we can see that this is true, then you develop confidence in the Buddha's teachings. We know that what he said is true, not because he said it, but because we have seen it for ourselves that what he said is true. If I were to tell Sister Angeline sitting here that you've got 10 fingers and she believes me without ever checking, that is faith. But the Buddha didn't want us to have faith. Sada in the Buddha's teachings is actually quite inaccurately translated as faith, meaning the English implication of the word faith. Because faith is a leap into the unknown. You have not seen it, you have not verified it, but you choose to believe it. That is faith. The Buddhist Dharma is not about faith. Sada is more akin to confidence. So if Sister Angeline is to look and say, ah, I've got five here and I've got five there. So I've got 10. Now, when she has verified that, she does not have to believe me. She knows that she has got 10 fingers. So that is confidence. It is not faith in the unknown, but confidence that what the Buddha taught is correct. We are all familiar with the late Chief Venerable's book, What Buddhists Believe. And I'm sure many of us in the same audience here would have heard the late Venerable say it many times, that for Buddhists, there is nothing to believe. You verify and you know for yourself. And when someone challenged him and said, then why did you write a book, What Buddhists Believe? He told a person, I wrote that book for you. Not for the Buddhists, but for the non-Buddhists. Well, we know how the late Chief Venerable was. Now, for example, let me show you about a reality. Put in a very funny way, but indeed a reality. If you eat healthy, drink lots of water, have a good sleep, and exercise every day, you will still die. <laughs> now that may sound horrible, but it is what is reality. And that is put in a funny way because I wanted that to hit it across you all. You can do all you want. You can jog, you can exercise, you can eat healthily, you can fast, you can do whatever, or eat organic vegetables. You may delay the inevitable, but the inevitable is reality. And none of us can escape from that. So while it is funny, it deals with reality. And that is what the Buddha wants us to see, hate on, and handle. Reality. So one of the main things which is very realistic and which the Buddha, in fact, wanted us to reflect constantly is the impermanence of our life. In the early years, 
when I talk about my death and the impermanence of my life, my wife will get very angry. She's in the audience right now. She says, shh, don't talk like that. But now after many years, she's either fed up or she has accepted the reality. Because that is a reality that the Buddha in fact said, every one of us must reflect on daily. Because when we reflect on how fragile our lives is, then we treasure our lives very, very much and we live it very meaningfully. I often say to face reality, one of the most important things I would wish if a genie is to appear in front of me and say, Puna, I give you a wish. I would say, I wish everybody will know exactly when he or she will die. Because if you, Sister May knows, exactly when you will die, I guarantee you, you will live your life quite differently. You will make sure you use every moment, every second very well. Whatever quarrel, swan laba. I mean, if I'm going to die in six months time, why bother about the quarrel? How do you know you're not going to die in six months time? So why are we bothered about that quarrel right now? If I'm going to die in three months' time, I say, I'm going to make my peace. Say hello, hello, everyone. You know, I'm your friend. I'm your friend. Anything I've done wrong, please forgive me. Anything I've done wrong, please forgive me. I forgive you for whatever you have done wrong. And we say we must be nice because we are going to die very soon. Isn't that, we tell, isn't that what we tell people who are dying? Right? Isn't that what we tell Dhamma family members who visit Dhamma family who are having terminal illness? We tell them all these things. Oh, take refuge in the Buddha. Reflect on all the good, wholesome things. Say sorry to those who offend you. Seek forgiveness. We too forgive you. Why we say? Because it is very important that this person must have a peaceful state of mind. You all understand that. Now, if you understand that, do you not understand that that is even more important now for us who are living? Don't we also need that peaceful state of mind? We also need it. If a person who's going to die in three months' time need it, the person who's going to die in 30 years' time also needs it. It is just as important. How are you to know whether you are going to be even alive three days from now? So we shouldn't delay that to the last three months of my life. What is so important in the last three months of your life should be even more important now as it is. So that is why one of the most beautiful teachings of the Buddha is reflect on the impermanence of your life every day and you will live your life quite differently like what I said just now. Let us take a look at this clip. Once upon a time, there were three old friends. They were all scholars, leading busy lives. But they made it a point to meet once a year to make sure they would always stay in touch with one another. But this time, the gathering felt different. They were all getting old and starting to feel their age. Sensing this, the first scholar remarked, we are all here together this year, enjoying each other's company. Able to come back and be together again next year. The second scholar laughed. Next year? I think you may be looking too far ahead and assuming too much. Today I am alive, but who can say with certainty if tomorrow I will open my eyes to greet another day? They turned to the third scholar, who had been quiet. He looked up at them thoughtfully and said, Tomorrow, my friends, as I sit here with you, I do not know if each breath I draw will be my last. Who can say with certainty if one breath will be followed by another? You see, life, life. This story is short but deeply meaningful. Measured life in terms of years 
as most people do. We think about the number of years we have lived and we still have. The truth is that we may not have many years or even one year ahead of us. Life, rather than measuring it in years or days, flows from one moment to the next, from one breath to the next. We simply do not know how many minutes or seconds we still possess. So the people who are important to you in your life, be grateful now, this moment, and not tomorrow or next year. Thank them now for their friendship and count your blessings of having a family right now. The Stare to Do Motivation Stories. I think that this video is short and very meaningful. I'm grateful to the Dhamma family, to my Kayana meters, because like in this story, there is no guarantee, especially in this era of COVID-19, of Omicron, which has just arrived in Malaysia. None of us can be sure. So let us live every moment well, treat it like you will treat if this is your last day or week. And certainly we will live our lives far more meaningfully. Let us take a look at this. Why is it that when we hold on to things and refuse to let go, we suffer? Dear Dhamma family, we are familiar with the first noble truth, which tells us of the dukkha that arises with birth, aging, sickness, death, not associate, association with those we do not like, dissociation from those we love, and of course, not getting what we want, and the five grasping khandhas. Dukkha is an emotional state of dissatisfaction, of unhappiness. And it arises because of the second noble truth. The second noble truth tells us that of tanha, often translated as craving. Craving, attachment, as you learn in dependent origination, is what will give rise to our sufferings. Now, the realities of life is that our children will grow up. The realities of life are that people we love will pass on, will age. The realities of life are that we will fall sick sooner or later. The Buddha tells us to deal with these realities in a harmonious, compassionate way and not bang our hearts, bang our chest and say, why me, why me, why me? because the reality is why not you? So as long as you do not see reality, you do not have the right view that this is but you insist that it be the other way or you hold onto concepts that you refuse to let go, we are gonna suffer. For many years while working as a doctor, I would see elderly ladies come in and complain 
our daughter-in-laws, not being like what they were when they were daughter-in-laws themselves 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I often will tell them that, Auntie, your daughter-in-law can never and will never be like you were when you were a young daughter-in-law 30, 40 years ago. It is impossible because your daughter-in-law grew up in a different era, had a different education and in a different culture and time completely. So it is impossible that she will be like what you were 30, 40 years ago. And if you are to insist that your daughter-in-law must be like what you were as a daughter-in-law 30, 40 years ago, everybody is going to suffer. Yes, you will continue to be very unhappy. Your daughter-in-law will be very unhappy and your son will be caught in between. Now, this is not seeing realities, but holding on to concepts or views that a daughter-in-law must be like that. Well, times are impermanent and they have changed. And she will never be like that. So if you insist, everybody will suffer. But if you have the right view and you can understand and see and live harmoniously, please remember the full path is for us to live harmoniously. And one of the great things in life is to accept it is like that. What you can't change, we accept. We flow like water around rocks. Now, it is not that impermanence is all the time bad. Eh? Impermanence can be good as well. For example, even COVID-19 is impermanent. This pandemic also will end one day. The virus will keep mutating, mutating, and mutating, and one day, it will either disappear or become harmless, hopefully, or it becomes so potent that it kills off the host and the virus cannot replicate anymore. So even the COVID-19 era is impermanent. So it too will pass. It too will change. Are you having the best day of your life? Good for you, but it will pass. Are you having a hangnail? That irritating small torn piece of skin on the side of your nail, don't worry, it will pass. Having the hiccups, it will pass. Are you being forced to watch a chick flick or a reality TV show with your girlfriend? It will pass. Are you busted by your brother watching a chick flick on your own? It will pass. Do you want to watch a 20 second video and you have to watch a commercial for 45 seconds? <sighs> It will pass. Is your girlfriend baking banana chocolate muffins with sprinkles on it for you? Sadly, it will pass as well. There is one unchangeable truth, and that is ironically that everything changes. Nothing will ever stay the same. When you are feeling lonely, it will pass. When you are having tremendous pleasure, it will pass. Everything we will ever experience is impermanent. What I personally think that this means is that when you are having a good time, enjoy it. And when you're having a bad time, remember that these things will pass as well. This will give you strength. Or in the example of you having to watch reality television, you can also, of course, throw the television out of the window. And when your girlfriend reacts angry about it, remember, it will pass. Thank you for watching this video. Have a great up. So the good thing about impermanence is that even what is unhappy, what is bad, will also pass because it is also imperfect. Now, one of the important messages I like to share is that as you walk this path, as you learn the Buddha's teachings, as you develop right view, you will actually become more and more happy. If you walk this path and you become more and more frustrated, and say, because I see the realities of life, I become even more sad, then something is wrong. Because as you walk this path, you must become more and more happy. If you are becoming more and more happy, then yes, you are writing, you are walking the path correctly. 
But if you are feeling more and more miserable, something is seriously wrong. Because the Buddha's path for which he wants us to follow is a path that will lead to happiness. Not in the future, but now, here and now. And the Buddha himself was always a very happy and at ease person. So with your Kayana meters, you should be able to handle many, many difficulties in life by yourself and also with their help. And spiritual friends are so important because we support each other when life becomes difficult as it will. Do not for any moment think that, oh, because I took refuge in the Buddha, everything will disappear and life will be a bit of roses. That doesn't happen. That is wishful thinking. That is wrong view. When you subscribe to the Buddha's teachings, you have got the best GPS to help you navigate the problems in life. And you've got Kayana meters who will help you. I'm very, very happy, for example, whenever I see Sakya in food pantry, and we say, yeah, COVID-19 is bad. So many people have lost their jobs. So many people have lost beloved family members. So many businesses. See the goodness of people. For example, within Sakya Inn, where we are right now, that actually happily donate money, food, material to support other people who are in need, without question. Same thing I saw in Subang Jaya Buddhist Association. They're also doing the same thing. Hopefully all this will pass one day, not too far in the distant future. Now, when you help out, you develop a different kind of happiness. When you buy a new car, you have the mundane happiness of enjoying the leather smell of that new car that plastic smell as you step into that car and that beautiful smooth engine as you drive it. That is mundane happiness. Happiness from the gratification of your senses, happiness from the satisfaction of your craving. And that's a very temporal type of happiness. When Sister May, Sister Angeline, Brother Kim Shui comes to Sika in to help out, to bring food to the needy, send food, to some elderly lady who is lying bedridden at home or merely distribute food out to some unknown person who walked in and said he needed free food. You develop another kind of happiness, not the happiness of the gratification of senses, but a supramundane happiness because you are doing something noble. Your Kayana meters will encourage you in this path they will support you when you slide back. And I'm personally very grateful to all the Kayana meters that I have. We have lots of fun. We eat together very often. And we celebrate with the flimsiest of excuses. And we push each other spiritually. Within every one of us is the Buddha nature. What is called the Buddha nature? The ability to choose to be good, like the Buddha, to choose to be noble instead of the opposite. There are two things. One thing is that, you know, to, to develop this quality, which in Buddhism is called uh, mindfulness or awareness, which means the quality as much as possible of being present in the moment and being conscious of what one is doing, what one is thinking, just being aware, not interfering, but just knowing. And so that, you know, this is also a very good way to deal with stress, you know, just to take some deep breaths and be, just feel yourself in the present. And this is something which has always been very much inculcated in, in all Buddhist traditions through the ages, this quality of being mindful and being aware. And along with that, the, the quality of being able to open up the heart and to, first of all, include others 
and then gradually learn to place others before yourself, to appreciate that all beings want to be happy, whether they're nice beings or ones that you find difficult, and to wish for their happiness. So that makes, you know, even in your family, in your work, in anybody that you meet, that recognition of their essential Buddha nature and of their need for, for happiness in this lifetime and, and the desire to give them that happiness, or at least to be kind. I mean, if one could learn kindness and patience and uh, consideration and caring for others, that would take up a lot of, uh, you know, the stuff in our, our lives where we think that, you know, that our, our everyday life doesn't have any meaning. All right, dear Dhamma family, that's Tenzin Palmo, highly, highly respected Bikuni. Now, Metta and Karuna, as the next slide will show you, are crucial. As we see the realities of life, like what we are all seeing now, you will realize that we can attenuate, we can relieve, we can help each other be happier and more comfortable by merely applying this metta karuna in our lives, as what Venerable Tenzin Palmo stated, mindfully. Everybody wants to be happy. It is rare to find someone who wants to be unhappy. Of course, there are some psychological states whereby people punish themselves because of what they think they have done wrong and they purposely inflict all kinds of pain on themselves. But generally, almost everybody wants to be happy. We seek happiness. A lot of people buy happiness through sensual gratification, shopping, endlessly buying things, because that shopping gives them a temporary sense of happiness. But as every one of us in this hall knows, it's only a very temporary thing because you are merely trying to fulfill the second noble truth. And that second noble truth of an emotional state of craving will merely be replaced by the next craving and the next craving and the next craving. It's only a very temporary satisfaction when you buy a new phone or a new computer. And after a while, it's back to square one. So we all seek happiness, you and I, for those of us walking the Buddhist path, we try to go beyond mundane happiness and we want supramundane happiness. Love and compassion, metta karuna. I repeatedly shared the last two years to this online audience, our works. They have to be put into action. We can say metta, 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 karuna, karuna, karuna a million times and do absolutely nothing it's going to have very little impact. What the major centers like Subang Jaya, Sikya In are doing in their action is far more impactful on teaching the younger generation what is meta than we talking to them a thousand times about meta being a very important quality and doing nothing. I tell my medical students, Metta is a verb. If we are to learn metta from any one of the seniors, then it is through the actions of the seniors and not just the words of the seniors. So we try our very best to do whatever we can to help via the Buddhist community in Johor Bahru, for example, and of course, the greater community. Now, this wonderful message of the Buddha, it's sharing. It's one of the things which gives us supramundane happiness. And that's why we are more than happy, the team that came to Sakya Inn and say, yeah, we will come to Sakya Inn and share. Why? Not because Brother Tan is going to give us a lot of money to come in here to share. No, not because of anything other than the simple fact that the sharing of the Dhamma is the highest gift, the Buddha said. 
and it is sharing. We have happiness. We develop happiness. We actually feel not the happiness of buying a new car, but a different form of happiness when we say we are sharing the Dhamma. Look at this book, which we brought to give every one of you in the hall here. Take a few copies, give one to your friend, your neighbor, more importantly, your enemy, make sure he has one. Hopefully he reads it. Now, do you know that the money to print this book was raised within 24 hours? Within 24 hours of us opening our mouth and say, we want to raise funds to print this book. People rush to support because they know it's a good project. And in here is what is basically the message of the Buddha put into very pictorial form, very briefly, hopefully helping someone to understand this profound message. Now, as I said, please do not for any reason walk away thinking that the Buddha said, all is suffering, all is suffering. No, 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 no. The Buddha told us that there are lots of happiness in life. It is just that these happiness are happiness of the satisfaction of gratification of our senses. It is unreliable. It is impermanent. And soon you will change and want a new one. A car example, a girlfriend example, a mistress example, etc., etc., etc. You can buy a new handbag, so you'll be happy for one week. Then after that, you see another more beautiful handbag. No end. So when you have right view, you will realize that all these material things that you will seek after are basically just temporary objects like chewing gum giving you temporary satisfaction, and that's it. Now, I have shown the next video before, but it is such a beautiful video that I want you all to see it again and again. Celebration of your blessings is happiness. The more and more I celebrate what I have in life, the manifestation of that is happiness. Man had called for a party and everybody had come and everybody were dancing and there was absolute excitement in the air and nobody knew what for what this party was called. He called so they all came and, every, and he looks the happiest person there and he is enjoying, he is freaking out. So one person took a lot of hesitation and finally went out. Is there any purpose behind this party? Yeah, you didn't know that? Morning, my must has been met with a very bad accident. And it's completely damaged. Everybody stopped dancing. What? Must this went met with an accident? You call for a party. Is it up? Nothing happened to the driver. I was driving. And the man paused for a moment. I said, the Mercedes Benz is gone. And with money, I will buy 10 more Mercedes Benz in my lifetime. But if my little finger is gone, gone, nothing happened to the driver. And he told friends, let's understand whether it is a 60 rupee toy car or a 60 lakh Mercedes Benz. What money can buy is called a toy. It's only a toy. And you should understand this. Rolls Royce is a four crore toy. Give it rightful place. Then you will enjoy. Otherwise you will not enjoy. Some of these buggers, have you seen? They will not remove the plastic cover from the seat at all. Not there, but seat will get dirty. I'm saying it will give you a better solution. You make a plastic cover, cover yourself. Go everywhere inside the plastic cover. It's a toy. The more and more you learn to celebrate what you have in life, it's called happiness. Happiness is celebration of blessings in life. So what is happiness? Happiness is when Sister Angeline queue up for goodness know how long to buy us ta chung for 
Pia with added lard just now this afternoon to eat. That is happiness. Not because it's the most wonderful popia that I've eaten in my life. I'm 60 over years old. I have to admit that's the best popia I've eaten in my life. But the fact that she was willing to go to that shop there, probably haggle with the lady, bargain and queue and whatnot, to buy that popia and bring it to our hotel for us to eat. That is happiness in life. It is that relationship which is important because... Will someone else do it? I don't know. Sister May may do it. She brought very lovely kueh for us to eat at lunchtime. And someone else will do it too, I'm sure, for some other reason. Some of them barely even know us. But they were wanted to do it. Why? Because they say, you are coming to Malacca. We want to make you happy. We want to make you feel welcome. That is important. That is the celebration of life, isn't it, Sister May? Everything else? I agree entirely, it's a toy. It's a toy, you know. Whether you live in a big 6,000 square feet bungalow house or a small 1,400 square feet condo, ultimately it's the same. I, my wife and I used to live in a 6,600 square feet bungalow house. I thought it was a great house. Well, it was great in the sense that the children grew up in a huge bungalow house. Now we live in a 1,400 square feet condominium. And many people have actually asked us, how do you do it? How do you downgrade from that beautiful bungalow to this? I said, actually, all we need ultimately is six feet by about two feet. So even a 1,400 square feet bungalow is a uh, condominium is very big. My children have all left home. They are grown up. They are married. It's only me and my wife. I do not need to play hide and seek with her. She can shout from one end of the condo and I can hear her quite clearly at the other end. So they are all toys. They are all things that gives us mundane happiness. Yeah, of course, we need mundane happiness. But we work hard for supra-mundane happiness as well. And this is Leo Tolstoy, one of the people I greatly admire. And Leo Tolstoy tells you very honestly that if your religious teacher or somebody teaches you that you work very hard so that you get a heavenly reward in your next life, you're out. You've just been conned. Whatever happiness you're going to get is in this life. Not in some imagined next life. For those of you who may know, Tolstoy was greatly influenced by Buddhism. So we really don't have to wait for the right circumstances to have happiness. You can be happy at any time, at every moment. And now I reach the last of the realities. Anatta. Anatta is the most difficult of the realities for us to understand, to have direct insight. Not self. That there is nothing permanent in you. Nothing concrete. Nothing unchanging. If you can truly understand anatta, you're at the door of awakening. You're literally at the door. You understand anatta, anicca dukkha, you understand emptiness or kung. I'm going to let you see this clip, which I've actually cut to make as succinct as possible. The late Venerable Punaji trying to teach this very complex concept. So please try and listen. It is because we are thinking that being for the Buddha was not a reality. Being was a concept. The Buddha saw this as a concept that we form the concept of being. We are changing from the time we are born. We are in a process of change. We keep on changing. The person who is born is not the same person who dies in old age. The body has changed. The mind has changed. 
everything has changed. It's something else. But we don't think like that. It, we think it is the same person who died. So that concept of being, which is the continuity of existence, that is what is creating the problem. Because I am being, I am born, then I grow old, and then I die. So the I is always there, the being. So as long as we think like that, then we are thinking about the change and the impermanence of our being. And that is how it, we become unhappy about it, because we don't want that. We, because we are being, we want to continue to be. And we want to continue to be young. No, we don't want to continue as old people. <laughs> That's a problem. So being is a static concept. A static concept in a dynamic reality. A dynamic reality. We are trying to cling on to a static concept, which is an illusion. A static concept is really emotional. It is an emotion that wants us to believe in the existence or being. Whereas when we think and reason out, we see the impermanence of these things. There is no real being. But our emotions tell us, no, there is a being. I want to be. So we cannot face death. So when we cannot face death, we have to somehow believe that even when the body dies, I will still remain. Maybe go to heaven or go to hell and be, remain somehow. <laughs> so we want that permanence, which is all emotion. So actually what is happening is the emotion is coming in conflict with our reason. The emotion and con reason are in conflict. And when emotion and reason are in conflict, what happens? Emotion always wins. <laughs> That's what is happening. <laughs> That's the point. So therefore we become unhappy as a result. Because the emotion is being frustrated disappointed, so we become unhappy. So what this emotion is doing is, what the Buddha pointed out was that this emotion is saying, this is mine. Is still the attachment to this body. The emotion is becomes attached to the body and say, this body is mine. This body is mine, this mind is mine. These feelings are mine. This consciousness is mine. These thoughts are mine. We begin to personalize. 
and what we call the self is the sum total of all that we call mind all that is mind has been personalized so but dear dhamma brothers and sisters Venerable Punaji has very eloquently here tried to explain Anatta. We exist, but we are a continuously flowing protoplasm of energy. Nothing is same. We continuously change. So it is wrong to say you do not exist. Of course you exist. But you are existing as an activity of chemical reactions and energy and not something static. If an alien is to look at us and the alien can see beyond our range of vision, he will see that every one of us here is ceaselessly changing. None of us are the same for any moment. So while we exist as an activity, we insist on thinking of ourselves as a solid entity. And that is where we create suffering. Because you are gonna age, you're gonna fall sick, you're gonna have painful knees and painful back, and one day we are going to pass away. So, brothers and sisters, when you can understand all this and live harmoniously with it, then you will reduce your suffering. In the very first line of the Heart Sutra, it says that when you contemplate, when you look at yourself very mindfully, Huan Zi Ji, Huan Zi Zai Pu Sa, Huan Zi Ji Xian Zai, all right, you will see Zhao Tian Wu Yin Jie Kong. Wu Yin is the five khandas. You will see that what you consider as yourself, your aggregates, is empty. That means they are impermanent, they are unsatisfactory, and they are not self. When you can see Huan Zi Ji Xian Zai, Zhao Jian Wu Yin Jie Kong, you will do yi chie ku he. When you can see this realities, that is when you can transform your suffering. The physical suffering of the body need not be the mental suffering of the mind. The physical deterioration of the body need not be the mental suffering of the mind. You think two, it's here. None of us can escape the first arrow. That is because we have a conditioned body, but we can escape the second arrow of the pain in the mind. The very first paragraph in the Heart Sutra, if you want to understand the Heart Sutra, just understand the very first paragraph. And if you can understand the very first paragraph, you have already understood one of the major teachings of the Buddha Dhamma. When you look at this picture, you will see all of the three characteristics. Where is Dr. Wong? Is it this one? Or this handsome young man? Or this old aging man? which is Dr. Wong. Here you will see this dynamic process that we think is an entity. It's actually an activity ceaselessly changing, not an entity which is static, but we demand that it be static. We demand that it be permanent. And so when someone tells you, 
Believe me, Sister B, and I will give you eternal life. People crush at it, like a salesman selling you a nice car, because he's selling you what you want to hear. So if you look at the venerable Thich Nhat Han, he says that when you see the boy, you already see in this boy this old man. When you see this old man, you already see the next, the boy. When you see this beautiful flask that my wife bought for me to keep a drink warm whenever I share or whenever I teach, you already see it as a beautiful water container, but you also see it as a really broken, dented, faded. Then when it actually becomes dented, broken, faded, well, what do you expect? But if you demand that it remains the same, then you're going to suffer. Because this boy cannot remain the same. Neither can this young man remain the same. Neither can this old man remain the same. They will just continuously go in a circle. All the three characteristics are here. Now, often people will ask, what's the meaning of life given all these realities? Well, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, life has no meaning. We give life its meaning. By itself, life has no meaning. But Brother Tan, Sister Angeline, Brother Joseph, Sister May, my wife, Brother Key, we all choose to give life its meaning. And that is what we do to our life. Life is like a blank piece of paper for us to write, to paint. You can choose to do nothing or you can choose to do something. It's an opportunity for you to give it a purpose and a meaning. And I love this. The Buddha Dharma is beautiful. This little book, so much of it. But as long as it remains inside this little book, it is useless. There are many, many Buddhist centers in Malaysia where the entire Nikayas are all locked up in a beautiful cupboard and everybody walks past it. Serves no purpose. Well, maybe for the little insects that live on the paper, it does serve a purpose, but beyond that, it does not. Whatever is in here must be utilized. Whether it is the training of the mind, in meditation, whether it's the precepts, whether it's the concepts that we try to share, it has to be applied into everyday life. Hence, this is not the picture of the Buddha. This is the picture of Brother Juicing as he goes about his daily life trying to sell engine oil and motorcycle tires and motorcycle chain. It is Brother Juicing, Buddha nature in him awakening to do what is noble, what is right. It is Sister Angeline going to work and allowing every decision to be guided by the Dhamma. Every time she makes a decision based on the precepts, on mindfulness, on the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha nature in her is awake. Every one of us has that potential, except for a lot of us, many a times it's just sleeping nicely. But it will wake up when we choose to live our life meaningfully and purposefully. So with that, dear Dhamma family, I will close tonight's sharing and pass it back to Brother Tuan. And Brother Tuan, I'm afraid my battery is going low as stated here. So we will try and end this very fast. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. You, the computer battery allowed you to finish your sharing. That is the will of the strength of your Dhamma talk. Not to worry. All right, brother and sisters. Well, it has been uh, it's great uh, to have all of you listening to Dr. Puna's talk. And I must say is that the, there are a lot of information there and 
to me, this reading talk is a wake up call to all of us. The question is, anyone knows when we will be dying? I never thought of that. Hopefully, it will help us to guide how we should live. Now, my friends, this is a re repeated reminder to all of us. <laughs> all right, let's proceed to our Q&A. There are lots of questions. Let's try our best and see how we can uh, cater to them. All right, let me see. Ah, we have our regular uh, from Putra Heights, Brother Kowei Kim. If we reflect on death daily and constantly talk about the reality of impermanence, would that turn us into morbid, depressed, melancholic individuals? How about you? <laughs> well, I just spoke about that during the sharing itself. All right. Now, yes, that's one of the fears that people think about. Uh, as I said, even including my wife in the early days when I often talk about death and impermanence and say, shh, cannot talk like that one. But after a while, you begin to realize that whether you talk about it or not, it's the truth. It's reality. And whether we like it or not, it's happening every day. So, Brother Kowikin, instead of that impermanence making you morbid or depressed, that impermanence or that uncertainty or unreliability or instability of life should spur us to live our life fully. It should spur us to say, well, my future is uncertain. None of us have a future which is certain. Let us make full use of our life. Even if we are to die a year from now, can we look back and say, I have lived well. A life well lived is long enough. So <clears throat> instead of wallowing and say, oh, my future is uncertain, I think we would learn to live that future, learn to live that which is in front of us meaningfully. Now, many of us are already way past our 60s. So our past, as every day past, becomes even more and longer. Our future becomes shorter and shorter. May I remind you every day. But what you have is the present moment. That present moment is available to every one of us, no matter how long the future or how short the future. It is up to us whether we want to make full use of that present moment. So if you do not have right view, yes, you can end up very, very depressed. But if you have right view, you actually adapt to it and say, I will live whatever I have to the best of my ability. And even if I were to pass away, I can only say I have done my best and I have lived my life to the best of my ability. And I have tried my very best to help. And even if I did not help, I did not harm. As an example, we are very, very grateful to all the, one, all the people in Sikia in here for hosting us and allowing us to share in such a beautiful shrine hall full of history. They need not have to do it. But you know what Brother Tan said when I proposed to him that we want to use it? He said, if it is for Dhamma sharing, of course, no question about it. He said, use the hall. Use it by all means. And he rallied, of course, the people here to come and help us. Why? He doesn't have to do it. But he did it because he wants to make full use of the time that is available to him, to me, to the people of Sakya Inn. And so, Brother Ken, you are young. You have a long future ahead of you in theory. But none of us can ever be 100% sure. So, use your time well. As a doctor, I've seen many unfortunate things. I've seen many happy things. And I can only say it's unpredictable. So let it spur you to do good. 
Let it spur you to make use of your time rather than the opposite. All right, did each one? Thank you. Wonderful. So, Brother Awaken, you have very good personal advice from a doctor. So let's move on to the next question from BGF. Chap Lailin, I hope I pronounced correctly. How do we know that we have made the wrong choice? Does it mean we have to accept that we can't and should not change one's person's attitude, even though it will bring disharmony and disaster? Well, sister, right views is not one view. Okay, as I said, Ditti Upadana is one of the four Upadanas, one of the four grasping or attachments that can actually lead us to unfortunate circumstances. It is important for you to realize, as I said, right from the word go, that the Eightfold Path leads to harmonious living, to happiness, to wholesomeness, both for you and for other people. It is praised by the wise. Now, it is outcome related. So whether that view is going to be beneficial to you, you can actually see for yourself, in yourself and in the others. And if that view that you hold has given rise to lots of pain and suffering, then you can be quite sure something is certainly wrong. Right views will lead to right thoughts. Right thoughts will lead to right speech, right action, right livelihood. And this is supported by right effort, right mindfulness, and leading to right stillness, ultimately right knowledge and right liberation. If what we are doing or holding on is wrong views, then that wrong view will only lead us to wrong thoughts, wrong speech, wrong action, and a whole chain of events, which ultimately will lead you to actually see that you have created unhappiness in yourself and in your surrounding and those that you love and care for. So it is actually very obvious when something like that happens. That is when we will have to really reflect and see where have I gone wrong? And of course, seek the counsel of someone who can help us develop a wiser vision and change for the better. Now, one can be very dogmatic about certain things, but there are many suttas in which the Buddha said, no, that's not the way. You should not be dogmatic about certain things. In fact, that can give rise to a lot of unhappiness if we are very dogmatic about certain things. Now, I'm sure, sister, you would have heard many stories within the Buddha's life of how people came to the Buddha and say, ah, oh, I believe in you and I want to take refuge in you. May me and my family from now onwards be your lay followers till our death and for beyond. And what would the Buddha say? No, 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 general. You are a very famous person. Please do not do that. Please examine, reflect, contemplate. Check for yourself whether those teachings that I've told you are true, are correct, beneficial, good for yourself, good for your community, raised by the wise, and leads to wholesome outcome and happiness. And when only you can see those things, then yes, you believe in me. Not because I said it, not because my words said it. So it is very much experiential. I like the word that the late Venerable Bunaji used to use. He said it is very experiential. You can actually see it yourself. You can actually test it within your own personal experience. And then we can modify it. All right, thank you, sister. All right, thank you very much for th that interesting answer. Uh, let's, because of the time constraint, we will go for the last question. The last question goes to uh, SJBA, uh, Brother Leong Yu Ming. Often expectations do not meet reality. How does one strike a balance between expectations and reality? Wow. Good evening, Brother Yu Ming. 
Yes. I, at every session, I always have a question from Brother Yumi. <laughs> For the, almost coming to two years, you know, Brother Tuan. So that's very good of him. Now, expectations often do not lead to reality. I, I wrote that statement myself when Brother Whaley asked me for a summary. What are our expectations? Our expectations are that of permanence. You buy a car, you do not expect it to break down. You buy a computer, you imagine it will work forever. Right? You buy whatever and you imagine that it will be stable and reliable. That's the theory. But in practice, your car will break down. Your computer will slow and become corrupted. Because that is reality. So expectations and realities often do not meet. And when expectations and reality do not meet, they give rise to dukkha, emotional stress. So we are taught to have always a direct insight into reality. As I said, if this is a glass cup, then we will say, yeah, this is a beautiful glass cup, but this glass cup is already broken because it is unstable, it is unreliable, and while I might enjoy and use this glass cup, one day this glass cup will break. And when this glass cup breaks, I do not moan, I do not weep because that is what I know is nature to be unstable and unreliable. But if I insist on otherwise, then we all will suffer. So how do you strike a balance? How do you strike a balance is what Brother Yu Ming is asking. The balance is, of course, knowing reality, enjoying what we have. Now, please, Brother Yu Ming, do not for any moment imagine that I'm not asking you to enjoy that car or enjoy that computer or enjoy that cup. By all means, yeah, enjoy that cup, enjoy that computer. But at the back of your mind, when something goes wrong, do not say it is unexpected. As Ajahn Brahm said, oh, I've fallen ill today. I'm very normal. Because it is normal for us to fall ill. It would be abnormal for anyone to never fall ill. So Ajahn Brahm used to laugh about it. Oh, doctor, today I have fallen sick. I don't feel so good in my throat and all that. I am normal. And I'm sure almost all of you in this audience would have heard Ajahn Brahm say this. He doesn't say that falling sick is abnormal. Falling sick, he said, is normal. I expect it. And I like the Gladians Johor Baru motto, why not me? And I often use this to share, Brother Yuming. One of Ajahn Sumedho's earlier books, when he was still in UK, a lady with a child in the audience when he was sharing and the child was obviously unwell and sick and after the sharing the lady with the child approached Ajahn Sumedho and said look Ajahn look at all their other children they are so healthy they are so well but my child he has been sickly since birth he has been unwell for such a long time why Ajahn why is my child unwell Ajahn looked at her very sympathetically and said because he is born. It might sound harsh, but that's reality. It's like the Johor Gladian's motto, why not me? So why is it that the whole world can forsake, but I can't? You know, very often we see patients and we have to very sadly tell them, I'm so sorry, but the biopsy came back. It's cancer. And many people will react, oh, why me, why me, why me? This is a very common reaction. But someone who is well trained in the mind will say, ha ha, finally it's my turn, huh? All right, and you all know who said that, right? <laughs> the late chief venerable. Okay, finally it's my turn. <laughs> so, well, brother Yumi, I think we have to be realistic. All right, this is the realities of life. As Buddhists, we see them. We don't ask for the impossible. We don't expect otherwise. We see them and we deal with them in the best way that can lead to the most harmonious and least painful outcome. Remember the story of the two arrows. The first arrow, the physical pain, the breakdown of your handphone, 
the breakdown of the computer of the car, inevitable. Because these are sankara, they are conditioned phenomena. Second arrow, the mental thing. The Buddha said that, that second arrow is optional. So if you know, oh, of course, this handphone will break down. My wife's handphone lately has been behaving very odd, more odd than me. Every now and then it hangs, you know. At least I don't hang. But my wife's handphone, every now and then, her WhatsApp, uh, her my sachatra will not work, and this hangs and that's hang. And she will ask me how. Uh, I say, well, what do you expect? The phone is old. <laughs> what do you expect? Worst case, you need to buy a new phone. <laughs> so, well, that's reality. So expectation versus reality. Expectation, my handphone should last forever. Unrealistic. Reality is my handphone will break down. So let's walk the middle path. The first arrow will hurt. I, yo, I paid for this handphone so far. So far, spoil already. But I want a t-shirt which says it is as it is. I did not wear that t-shirt today, but it says it is as it is. In translated to Chinese, 世界样的啦. So I can tell my wife, why the handphone hang, why the handphone break down? 世界样的啦. Time to buy a new handphone. All right, thank you, Brother Tuan. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuna. This evening, one statement caught my attention, and I'm sure many of us felt that too. Everyone would die, but do you know when? Wow. That is a question that is not on my head. So if we can accept an understanding of this fact of life, then we'll be able to live differently, happy and peaceful, forgive others and also ask for forgiveness. So do some wholesome deeds to those who are in need during this difficult period, this pandemic period. Dr. Gunas talked this evening that open up our horizons on how to face reality of life, that everything is subject to impermanence. Dr. Puna advises us to reflect wisely every day on the realities of aging, sickness, and death, and not getting what we want or expected, and many others, and they advise us not to cling on to what we want or expected. We must develop the right view to see things as they really are. Then we can live harmoniously with the realities we face in life and gradually move from mundane happiness to Ramandine happiness. Thank you very much, Dr. Puna, for that wonderful talk. It's really good reminder to all our Buddhist friends out there.